Welcome to Black History in Upstate New York. This program was produced by Victoria Basulto in conjunction with the National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum and funded by the Catherine W. Davis Projects for Peace Fellowship awarded through Colgate University. Black History in Upstate New York will provide a combination of bite-sized informational videos and longer presentations by scholars on historical figures and places that emphasize the crucial role Black Americans have played in the history of upstate New York. The National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum honors anti-slavery abolitionists, their work to end slavery, and the legacy of the struggle, and strives to complete the second and ongoing abolition, the moral conviction to end racism. The Museum and Hall of Fame's contact information is available on the screen. Hello, and once again, welcome to Black History in Upstate New York. My name is Victoria Basurto, and today I have the honor of introducing our presenter, Graham Russell Gow Hodges. Dr. Hodges is a George Dorlin Langdon Jr. Professor of History and Africana Studies at Colgate University. He is the author or editor of 18 books, including David Ruggles, a Radical Black Abolitionist and the Underground Railroad in New York City. This autumn, Fordham University Press will publish the 25th anniversary edition of The Book of Negroes, African Americans in Exile After the American Revolution. The Book of Negroes is the British roster of black loyalists leaving New York City for exile in 1783. In December, Rutgers University Press will publish Hodges' edition with a lengthy biographical introduction of the Marion Thompson Wright Reader, commemorating the first black woman to earn a doctorate in the field of history. Hodges has directed seven National Endowment for the Humanities Institutes for school teachers on abolitionism and the Underground Railroad. He will direct his eighth institute in July 2022. Teachers interested in applying may do so this fall through the NEH website and may contact Dr. Hodges at the email provided on the screen. I'd like to now invite Dr. Hodges to begin his presentation. All right, thank you so much for being, being with me here today, Professor Hodges. Um, so I just wanted to get started off by asking the first question, um, which is how did you first learn about David Ruggles and what got you interested in researching his life and his work? Uh, thank you very much for inviting me and I'm really glad to be taking part in this uh, Upstate Initiative uh, with the National uh, Abolitionist Hall of Fame. Uh, I became interested in David Ruggles uh, as part of a large project uh, they did in the 1980s and 1990s, which resulted in the book Root and Branch African Americans in, East New in New York City and East New Jersey, uh, 1613 1863, which is published by the University of North Carolina Press in 1999. It's still in print. Um, Ruggles was one of the people that I learned about while doing this research. And I wrote about a paragraph or two on him in the book. And then I realized that there's a lot more to the story. Uh, and throughout my career, I've always enjoyed uh, recovering the lives of those people who are really important, but who historians have not given sufficient attention to. Uh, and Ruggles is one of these people. So uh, as I was completing the book, I, I spoke to uh, University of North Carolina Press about doing a biography of, of Ruggles and they were enthusiastic. Uh, and I eventually got around to doing it. it took me about 10 years uh, to finish it, uh, but it was really a, a wonderful project and I'm, I'm very proud of the book. Uh, so that's sort of how I got into it. Uh, and uh, since then I've maintained an interest in Ruggles and some things have come up that I wish were in the book, but uh, we could talk about those later. Yeah, um, one thing that really interested me when I read your book is how, of a, how much of a proactive person Ruggles was um, and considering how much he did in New York City, it was always very surprising to me that I hadn't learned about him earlier. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about that. Um, Ruggles was a very proactive person, as I just said, and despite having lived a very short life, he was involved in a variety of different um, activities. Could you speak a little bit about some of the work that he engaged in, specifically stuff like the New York Vigilance Committee, the Mayor of Liberty, and even at the end of his life, his hydrotherapy business? Sure, there's, there's a lot there. Um... Ruggles was born in Norwich, Connecticut uh, on March 15th, the Ides of March, 1810. And he lives until December 16th, 
1839 when he dies in Northampton, where he is operating a hydrotherapy a hospital. So he packs a lot into those 39 years. Um, Ruggles uh, can be described as a person of many firsts. Uh, he's really the first professional civil rights activist. And he, this is basically how he lives his life. He, he's also a journalist, uh, but that's really part of, of, of his activism. He's one, I feel he's pretty credited with being the first American journalist. Uh, he's one of the most first open underground railroad operators. Uh, he has the first bookstore for, operated by a black man. He operates the first magazine published by a black man, The Mirror of Liberty. Uh, he has a lending library. Okay? Um, he later on becomes a doctor of hydrotherapy and is respected around the United States. So there's a lot of things that he does. Now, where does he come from? Uh, as I mentioned, he's born in Norwich. He's the first son of seven children to David Ruggles Sr., who is a woodcutter, apparently had a bit of a drinking problem, and Nancy Ruggles, who was a very prominent caterer in Bean Hill, which is a, su a suburb of Norwich. And Bean Hill was where Samuel Huntington, who was the, one of the, the first uh, president of the Continental Congress, later governor of Connecticut, lives. Uh, so the Ruggles grew up in, a, in an area where, as a Black man, uh, he believed firmly in his e own equality. His mother taught him this. Okay? And she dealt with her customers with that same kind of presumed equality. Um, and Ruggles, I, I can kind of describe him as sort of a, a walking bill of rights because he firmly believed in, in personal equality, uh, in freedom of the press, uh, freedom of petition, speech, uh, trial by jury. We can talk about that a little bit later on. Um, freedom of movement. Okay? So, I mean, he's someone who epitomizes all of these American ideals as he's growing up. Now, uh, he's educated at the Second Congregational Church of Norwich uh, Sunday School. Uh, and had he been white, it's likely that Ruggles would have gone on to Yale and then become a prominent uh, congregational minister somewhere uh, in, uh, in, in New England. But he's a black man, young black man. So there's no Yale in his future. Uh, what he does is start off as a, uh, a mariner, uh, working the coastal routes between Boston and New York City. Uh, and these are little small, small coastal vessels engaged in, in local trade. Uh, and he works in that for a year or so, from the, around 16 or 17. Then he moves to New York City. This is very interesting because it's also key to some of his later personality. Um, at the age of 17, he opens a grocery uh, at Cortland Street and Broadway. This, today, there's a huge skyscraper there. Uh, but at that time, there was a, a large building with a lot of shops in it. Uh, Ruggles got the money from to operate this store from a family called named Bliss from uh, Norwich. And what this tells us is that uh, Ruggles was able to get the confidence and investment of prosperous whites uh, who believed in his future and were willing to, to put their money into him. And this is pretty unusual. Okay, um, but he has this, uh, this grocery shop um, and he advertises in uh, the uh, in Freedom's Journal, the first black newspaper. Initially, Ruggles says he's selling uh, Goshen uh, butter and cheese from uh, Goshen, New York. Um, and there's an interesting story there. Uh, he's also selling uh, alcohol, liquors, cigars, uh, and Subsequently, Samuel Eli Cornish, who is a pre Black Presbyterian minister, the editor of The Colored American, and a very prominent abolitionist, convinces Ruggles that he should become temperance. Okay, so he, this is one of the first reform movements that Ruggles is involved in. So he forswears that. And later advertisements for his grocery shop say that you know, he's no longer selling uh, alcohol. Okay. Uh, he also sells free produce products. And what does this mean? These are products that are made by free rather than slave labor. No sugar, no tobacco, okay? but rather flour, cloth, things like that that are made only by, by free labor. This introduces Ruggles, who is a number of years younger than, than Cornish, into the reform uh, and radical movements surrounding abolitionism, temperance, free produce, pacifism. Okay? All this nexus of reform 
within which Ruggles emerges as a key figure in the, in the, in the early yeah, 1830s. He does this also by working as an agent, uh, selling subscriptions first for the liberator, then later on also for the emancipators. But the only person that does that uh, sells news, uh, the, these uh, two very prominent abolitionist newspapers. This means, and going back to this business of freedom of movement, that he travels around New England, upstate New York, Pennsylvania, and perhaps even as far as Ohio, walking through small towns, talking to people, and selling them subscriptions to the liberator and the emancipator. Okay? Uh, and this gets him out there in the world. It is a very brave thing for him to do because uh, while it is the North, he could have been kidnapped uh, and sold into slavery in the South. He certainly was uh, subject to insult uh, and to, uh, to segregation, okay? but it gets him a, a sense of this vast territory in which he can work as an abolitionist. Uh, he's also very prominent in, as a young man uh, in the convention movement. And this is a, a black uh, uh, political operation that has national conventions every few years, beginning in the early 1830s, right through 1835, and later in the 1840s as well, in which black abolitionists come together uh, to plan strategy, uh, to state their opposition to uh, the lack of civil rights for blacks in the North, their opposition to the American Colonization Society, a, uh, their desire to re-get the vote, and also to sort of perform in political ways. Generally, blacks did not have political rights in the North. Uh, in the New York State, for example, a, a black man had to uh, post a $250 bond before he could vote. That's a really substantial amount of money uh, at, at the time. Uh, and it's really equal to a poll tax. Uh, so they wanted to get rid of that. So, but while they can't act in direct political fashion, they are practicing through these convention movements. Okay, so th these are the things that he does. Uh, by 1831 or so, he operates uh, this grocery. He hires escaped slaves like Samuel Ringgold Ward uh, to work for him. Ward and his brother both are employed in Ruggles' grocery shop. So uh, he's already beginning to work in underground railroad uh, fashion, uh, even as he operates his grocery. He opens a bookstore uh, by 1833 and there publishes uh, his uh, uh, first books, uh, which are attacks on Dr. David M. Reese, a very prominent New York physician who's a colonizationist, and someone who wanted blacks to leave the country. Uh, and these uh, pamphlets uh, are, are printed at the press of, uh, the, of, of David Ruggles. Uh, he writes them. Uh, you know, they're, they're small uh, presses, small, small operations, but at the same time, these are pamphlets he can get out easily. Okay? Uh, so by the mid-1830s, okay, he's already established himself as a journalist, as an underground railroad worker, okay? as an activist in the abolitionist movement, a very prominent one, by the way. He writes a lot of letters to the editor uh, in... Um, the Liberator, the Emancipator, but also a lot of other places. Uh, one of the things that he makes his comments about, and this is something he talks about a, de a de decade later, uh, is that he is on speaking terms and has dinner with very prominent New York journalists. He mentions particularly Moses Beach, who is the editor of the New York Sun, uh, the first of the uh, penny, pe penny papers, uh, the first of yellow journalism. And the fact that Ruggles knew and dined with Beach is an indication, again, of his presumption of equality. This at a time when nearly all white Americans firmly believed in white supremacy. So for this guy to say, as to say, for Ruggles to say, I'm a friend of Moses Beach and a lot of other wealthy New Yorkers, uh, this is something that's really hard for white supremacists to swallow. Through his contacts, uh, in the uh, abolitionist movement, he becomes friends, of course, with William Lloyd Garrison, uh, who is the principal abolitionist, but also uh, local New York businessmen uh, like Lewis and Arthur Tappan, who are the uh, funder, funders for the Emancipator. Okay? Uh, 
he gets to know uh, William Jay, who was the son of the Chief Justice and former governor of New York and now a very prominent lawyer. Uh, and he works with these businessmen and this lawyer uh, to push uh, rights for people. For example, he, he, he sends letters of appeal for money to Jay to ask him to help out in the case uh, uh, of a young man who had been kidnapped uh, from, from Westchester. And Jay helps him out. Okay? Again, this is the kind of networking, fundraising, okay, activism, for which Ruggles becomes very, very famous. Okay? Uh, so all this is happening in the early 1830s. Mind you, he's in his early 20s at this point. I mean, he's a, he's a young guy. He completely gives himself over to the movement. Uh, a couple of things he's involved in. He's uh, part of the Philomathian Society, uh, which is designed to uh, create uh, greater literacy among Blacks, uh, to establish a high school for Blacks. Okay? Uh, and these are organizations in which he's, uh, he, he, he works with other Black activists, with white activists, on things that will generally improve uh, African-American life uh, in New York uh, and, and elsewhere. So, you know, again, this is a man who is a professional activist, and he does this in many, many different directions. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I, I definitely think that one of the one of the most interesting aspects of the book for me was how much um, his activities sort of highlighted his personality. Like you're saying, he gave himself over completely to the cause. And I think yeah. some of the occasions that you talk about in which he was like, for example, thrown out of a train for refusing to give up his seat, um, as well as the amount of work that he put into finding what happened to kidnapped um, Black Americans through the New York Vigilance Committee. I think these activities speak a lot to who he was as a person. Um, and something that I think is, is very great, um, little snapshots into his life. And so I wanted to go off of what you said earlier about the network that he created, uh, because I think that's something that was really interesting, especially in a program that is about you know, Black Americans in upstate New York is how much Ruggles came to know abolitionists, not just like William Lloyd Garrison, but um, ones that were actively working in upstate New York itself, like Frederick Douglass, um, Stephen A. Myers, Garrett Smith, uh, and Beriah Green. And so I wanted to see if you could talk a little bit about how encounters with these individuals shaped the network of abolitionists across the state, as well as the Underground Railroad. You touched upon that already, but specifically, if you can talk about some of the relationships that he had with these individuals, that would be really great. Sure. Um, I won't certainly speak to that, but uh, let me also mention that Ruggles was fearless. And he's, he's actually a, a fairly large man. He apparently was well over six feet tall. Uh, he's a very uh, you know, physically imposing guy. Um, but beyond that, he's willing to go anywhere and do anything and speak freely about uh, himself. Uh, I mentioned that he was an agent for the emancipator and the liberator and this gets him to move across uh, uh, central New York uh, in, into uh, uh, Ohio uh, and Pennsylvania uh, and to, to go on to these, the, the, these small towns. Okay? So he has a lot of contacts there. Um, Ruggles also can, can speak very plainly with the local people in upstate New York known as the burned over district. This is an area of high evangelical uh, uh, faith. Ruggles was raised as a Congregationalist, and there are a lot of Congregationalists in upstate New York, a lot of Presbyterians. Okay? There is, is he, his knowledge of the Bible was formidable. He could quote the Bible very freely because he'd studied it so carefully uh, as a child. He uses biblical quotations constantly uh, within, within his writings. Okay? So he has this firm belief in God, a deep knowledge of, of, of the scripture, and these are the kind of things that will give him entree to people up uh, in, in central New York. Okay? So he's been an agent. Okay? Uh, he travels to the conventions. There's one in, in, uh, uh, in Philadelphia, there's one in Buffalo a little bit later on. Okay? Uh, you know, he, he goes to these kind of places. He writes to people. Okay? And he has a network of former uh, escaped slaves whom he has helped. Uh, the most prominent of all of these, of course, is Frederick Augustus Bailey, later known as Frederick Douglass, who comes to Ruggles's home in New York City uh, on Lispenard Street in 1838. The Douglass has escaped, but he's uh, broke, he's scared, he's lonely, uh, he has no friends, 
and Ruggles takes him in. And in the 10 days that Douglas spends with Ruggles, he watches Ruggles engage in uh, uh, cases about uh, runaway slaves. Uh, he lives and works uh, in, in the bookstore. Uh, Ruggles summons uh, Anna Murray from Maryland to come up and she's, she's very Douglas's fiance. They get married in Ruggles' home in a uh, ceremony officiated uh, by William uh, W.C. Pennington, uh, who is a black congregationalist minister in Hartford, Connecticut. And this is a, a sign of the, uh, the connections that, uh, that Ruggles uh, has uh, around the region. And, 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 and Pennington comes in and you know, uh, does the, the ceremony. Okay. Later, Douglas is, goes up to New Bedford armed with a $5 bill and a letter of recommendation from Ruggles. Okay? And Ruggles claimed that he did this for about 600 people. Okay? So these are the kind of people who would be sent up to maybe to you know, someplace like Morrisville or Casanova okay? uh, or Sheds, maybe even Hamilton, okay? uh, where Ruggles knew people from his travels, from his attendance at the famous 1835 New York State anti-slavery convention in Utica. Okay, uh, these are the kind of contacts who, for whom a letter from David Ruggles meant that the possessor would get a job. Okay, you know, it's, it's one thing to escape from slavery. It's another thing to have to get some employment. And most of these young, uh, restless escaped slaves didn't have any contacts in the North. So Ruggles is extremely important that way. Okay, uh, and he could send people to Garrett Smith uh, in, in Peterborough. Now, how does he know Garrett Smith? Well, he knew it from before because Garrett Smith is a very famous uh, 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 money man for, for the movement. But in 1835, uh, Ruggles and several other black men are accompany a couple of hundred white abolitionists uh, at the New York State anti-slavery movement uh, meeting in, in Utica. Uh, that meeting is mobbed by uh, anti-abolitionist uh, rioters. Uh, at that point, Smith, who had been a little more conservative about how he viewed abolitionism, sees that the anti-abolitionist movement is so violent, so determined to wipe it out, that it radicalizes him. And he invites all of the participants to come down to Peterborough, walking, coach, by boat, a, uh, however they can get there and resume the meeting in Peterborough. Okay. So Ruggles is among them. And this is how he gets to meet people. And how do we know this kind of thing? Well, there's a very interesting letter that, that uh, surfaced a year or so ago and was sold at auction in New York City uh, from uh, Ruggles to a man named Ezra Stiles, who was a Congregationalist minister uh, in Syracuse. Uh, and Ruggles writes to Stiles, and this is, Stiles is from a very prominent family from New Haven. Uh, Ezra Stiles Hall is a, is, a, is, a, is a building at Yale. Okay. Um, but this member of the family is out in Syracuse uh, uh, preaching uh, in the congregational church there. Ruggles writes to him and says, you know, I think we should start up a committee of vigilance in Syracuse. And what do you think about that? Okay. We don't know how Stiles responded to that, but we do know that uh, the Committee of Vigilance was strong uh, throughout uh, upstate New York, Pennsylvania, a, uh, and Ohio. It spreads very, very rapidly. And there's a wonderful new book coming out next year talking just about that extraordinary spread. Ruggles begins the New York City Committee of Vigilance in New York City in 1835. The, media, the, the, the movement spreads like wildfire. In part, that's because of its appeal. And these, these are ways in which local people can help out fugitive slaves, fight kidnappers, okay, fight against the resurgence of the actual slave trade, which is a very real thing, okay, uh, and coalesce a, 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 as a movement. It starts in New York City with Ruggles. It's not only the appeal, it's also all of his contacts. Okay? So someone like Stiles in Syracuse, Okay. Uh, or Stephen Myers, a black man who operates the Toxin of Liberty 
a, uh, in, uh, in Albany. Um, these are, are, are friends of, of Ruggles. Okay? A Abel Brown, uh, who attends uh, the Hamilton Theological Seminary, which later becomes Colgate University, okay, uh, knows Ruggles. Okay? Uh, and these are men uh, who are inspired by him, okay? uh, who are great contacts of his. And uh, Abel Brown uh, is, an, an, is a temperance guy. He's an abolitionist. Okay. Uh, he has a career very much like Ruggles um, in that he travels around and risks his life uh, and, and his body uh, in, in spreading the word about abolitionism and, and, and temperance. Uh, so the, these are, there are people that, that he knows. I mean, they're either former enslaved people like Frederick Douglass, okay, who then rise to prominence. Okay, and there are, there are a number of these. Uh, I've also mentioned uh, Samuel Ringgold Ward. During the 1840s, Ringgold Ward uh, is a congregational minister in uh, uh, Homer, New York, which is just north of, uh, of Cortland in central New York. Okay, uh, so uh, these are people he knows. He knows people at the very top of society, like the Tappan brothers, William J. Okay? He knows more middling rank people like, like Garrison. Okay? Uh, of course, Garrett Smith is also a, a very, very wealthy man. Uh, Ezra Stiles is probably more middle class. He also knows black activists who may have education like he does, but certainly don't have the kind of economic uh, status and, and wealth of, of, of their white counterparts. Uh, so he has this vast network. Okay? He has the respect of people, okay? uh, and they, they're inspired by him. Okay? Uh, and he has a track record. So when he sends out a letter, it, it's meaningful. Okay? Uh, and this is a way in which he can uh, uh, continue his career uh, and be an inspiration. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I really like a lot of these names that you mentioned will be connecting throughout other presentations in this program. So it's very useful to know how an individual like David Ruggles created these vast connections with people from all over um, upstate New York, but also just in general, New York State. I guess the last question I wanted to talk about is a little bit about the end of his life. Um, I think that especially considering that you said David Ruggles was, was a man of many firsts. Um, being a doctor in this time through his hydrotherapy business um, is definitely a very, was one, was one of the most interesting parts of the book for me because it's not something that you hear that much about. I know the power of print, for example, makes a lot of sense in, in moving his business, uh, sorry, in moving the, the movement forward. And I, th I thought that this was a very interesting sort of deviation from not, just, not the movement because he did continue his connections, but can you speak a little bit about how this sort of concluded his life, but also how he tried to integrate this into the movement and um, sort of uh, speaks to more of, his, of who he was as, as a person, not just as an activist, but an entrepreneur, um, someone who's very active until the very end. Yeah, terrific question. Um, part of this has to do with his personality uh, and the reasons for him leaving New York City. Uh, Richard Blackett is a wonderful scholar and one of the best writers on the Underground Railroad. Uh, once told me, he said, uh, Graham, don't be afraid to say that uh, Ruggles could be a very difficult person. Uh, and again, he's, this is all about the movement. You know, this guy never marries at a time when a guy like him should have been fairly attractive uh, to a, a young black woman. Okay? But, you know, he devotes himself to the movement. By the late 1830s, he's gotten into a big conflict with Cornish. Okay? Uh, He's been accused of mishandling funds, probably true, but I don't think it was out of uh, deception, simply with he was simply handing out $5 bills to people all the time. Okay? He leaves New York City. He's terribly sick, he's nearly blind. Uh, he has major stomach problems, which I identify as worms, is a very common problem for poor people at the time. Okay? Uh, he's homeless for several years. Eventually he winds up in Northampton, Massachusetts at uh, a commune known as Northampton uh, Institute of, uh, of, of Culture. Okay? Uh, and there uh, he's taken in as the sole black member. Okay? Uh, he becomes very interested in hydrotherapy. He says, you know, he's got a list of all the things that he's been uh, treated in. This is during the, what you might call the heroic age of medicine. So the, the treatments he had were probably pretty, uh, pretty awful to us. Okay. Hydrotherapy seems to work for him. Okay. Uh, it also speaks to his whole evangelical 
position of the cleansing of the body, okay? uh, you know, a purification uh, through, a, through a, a natural element. Uh, so he studies, he's blind at this point, but he has some of the local girls read hydrotherapy manuals to him. Now, when I mention hydrotherapy uh, to, to audiences, they usually get a smirk at it and say, you know, it's, it's this, but at the time it was seriously considered as a uh, uh, sound medical practice. Okay? Uh, a lot of the uh, hydrotherapy institutes were sort of like spas where you go to you know, relax for a while and take a, you know, take a few showers, do some swimming, get off the grid of life. Okay? But Ruggles is very rigorous about this, you know, and his, uh, the, uh, the protocol he established, for example, for William Lloyd Garrison, uh, had Garrison get in at four o'clock in the morning and taking a cold shower, followed by some uh, diet of graham crackers and, and, and milk and then more showers and being wrapped in cold sheets. Basically, the whole idea was to bring your body up to a crisis, at which point you would either survive or not. Okay. Uh, Ruggles studies this. He writes uh, in the Green Mountain Spring, which is uh, a very prominent uh, hydrotherapy uh, magazine. So he continues his, his journalism. Okay. He also establishes a home in Northampton, uh, where the David Ruggles Center is now. Okay. Uh, and there continues his context. Now, again, he's not that physically able. He's not able to travel that much anymore. Uh, but people come and stay with him. Okay. Uh, the Dorsey family, uh, uh, escapes from Maryland, uh, and there's, you know, they, they eventually wind up in Northampton, they, they, they live near him. Uh, the David Ruggles Center is, is found there are about eight or nine different Black families uh, who lived in Northampton, very close to David Ruggles. Okay. He treats anybody who comes, so he treats Sojourner Truth, he saves her from alcoholism. I mentioned Garrison. He, all, he, meant, he treats John Brown's wife, and he got to know John Brown through that. Okay. Uh, he also treats a, 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 a slave owner in the South okay? because, you know, his man was sick and, and needed help. And Ruggles had a very good reputation. I mean, there are people who recognize Ruggles' skills, even in Alabama. He corresponds with a doctor down there. Okay. Um, by 1845, he's ready to expand. So he goes to uh, uh, Ezra Benson and some of the other members of the Northampton Association uh, and asks them for loans. And these are Yankee uh, financiers. These are not guys who give out their dollars easily, but they fund the development and the construction of Ruggles' hospital devoted to hydrotherapy. And he operates that between 1845 and 1849 uh, when, when he dies. Okay? And at some point, the place is full. You know, he's got 25, 30 people in there. Okay? Uh, and he spends every day working with them. Uh, he continues to write. His name, his name is actually National. Okay? Frederick Douglass comes to visit him, along with the Hutchinson family singers, who are folk singers and kind of a, like a, the rock group of the abolitionist movement uh, in the 1840s. They have a very famous uh, dinner uh, at Ruggles' home in 1845, and, 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 and Douglass writes about this. He's public. Douglass is selling at this point his famous narrative. And I want to mention that because R R Douglas refuses to identify most of the people who helped him escape in 1845, with one exception. And that exception is uh, David Ruggles. Now, by identifying Ruggles, he opens Ruggles up to prosecution for harboring and abetting a fugitive slave. But not only is Ruggles mentioned, but his name is in caps. Okay, so it's like Ruggles saying, yes, I helped this man. Uh, and Douglas he puts it right in there in the book, of course, becomes a, a nationwide uh, bestseller uh, and now is a, a standard text for uh, uh, American literature and history. Okay. Ruggles continues again, you know, Garrison comes to stay with him uh, and, and, and be treated by him. It's too much for Garrison. He can handle for two weeks and then leaves. Okay. Other people hang in there. Uh, sadly enough, though, uh, Ruggles' health does not continue. By, by the fall of 1849, he's in very desperate shape. Okay? Uh, he has to disband the hospital, try to focus on uh, his, his own health. Um, 
but by December of 1849, uh, he's failing uh, and, and dies. Uh, and this is something which is a, a real tragedy. He's only 39 years old. Okay? Uh, but it's testament to the costs that the movement made on these young black activists. And 40 sounds like a very early age of death for us today. It actually is pretty close to the average age of death for, for poor people in, in America. And for all of his erudition, his fame, uh, his activism, uh, Ruggles falls into that class. He does not have any wealth. Okay? Uh, today, he's buried in Norwich, Connecticut, somewhere near his mother. We're not really sure exactly where. Okay? Uh, but his death in 1849 is, 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 is a real sadness. And, and Douglas writes a, a, a beautiful, very moving tribute to him in the North Star and says that he was the first person about whom I ever learned about the Underground Railroad or ever learned anything about freedom in the North. Okay, uh, and said he, will, he can never be replaced. Uh, and that's really the story uh, of David Ruggles. He was kind of a, a, a one of a kind. Okay? He was an extraordinary personality. Uh, he was a candle that, that burned very brightly and eventually was extinguished. Um, but you know, today uh, he's become much, much more famous. Uh, Eric Foner, uh, uh, Jonathan Wells have both featured him in books recently. People are captivated by, by, by Ruggles, by, by his courage, uh, by his accomplishments, okay? uh, by his uh, utter defiance of racial mores, okay? uh, by the people he helped, and just by being a person that devoted himself uh, to, to freedom and equality. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I will be linking your book in the description. So if people want to sort of read a little bit more of a complete story of David Ruggles, they can. But yeah, thank you. It was an honor to have you um, for this interview. And I really do hope people look more into David Ruggles and that in the future, he will be mentioned even more in history books. Thank you. Thank you. I hope so too. I'd like to thank Dr. Hodges for that wonderfully informative presentation. I'd also like to thank you, the audience, for joining us today. If you'd like to learn more about David Ruggles, I highly recommend that you read Dr. Hodges' book, David Ruggles, A Radical Black Abolitionist and the Underground Railroad in New York City. I'd also recommend that you visit the David Ruggles Center for History and Education's website at davidrugglescenter.org. You can also visit the space physically at the address provided on the screen. Lastly, please do fill out the survey whose link is available on the screen and will also be available in the video description. This survey will allow you to provide general feedback about the program as well as about this presentation. Your feedback will help us in the formulation of future presentations and programs like this one. Thank you for joining us today and I hope we see you again tomorrow.